Hey everybody, so Kurt Davis here again. Uh, thought I'd do another video today. Uh, a little more uh, pieces here that I think might be valuable for uh, investors out there. I've titled this one, How to Analyze Single Family Rental Properties. So since I am in the business of selling single family homes, typically from a turnkey model, uh, I thought this would be a good video to do. Uh, some some of the information I'm going to talk about uh, would be considered maybe basic information for experienced investors, uh, but you know I'm kind of targeting people who are either maybe brand new to considering investing or or you know very early on in their due diligence period. Uh, so and keep in mind, you know, there's many many ways to analyze rental property. I'm just going to touch on a few ones that. Uh, I see that a lot of investors look at, especially when they're looking at houses when we're trying to sell them. So with that in mind, here we go. All right, so uh, some of the things I'm going to cover today, I'm going to talk about cash flow, uh, gross versus net cash flow. We're going to talk about vacancy and repairs, CapEx, return on investment, purchase to rent ratio, otherwise known as the 1% rule, uh, grading property, and a little bonus at the end. All right, so a lot of people, when they look at purchasing rental property, uh, one of the things they always look at is, is what's the cash flow? Well, cash flow is, I define it as, it's the amount of money left over after your projected or actual expenses uh, are paid. Now, if you're buying a property that's already rented out, you could say that that's actual expenses because, I mean, you know what it's rented out for. Uh, you know what the mortgage is going to be if you're doing financing, property management, things like that. So my little formula is is rent minus your expenses will equal your cash flow. So what are some of the expenses? Well, your mortgage, uh, taxes, insurance, property management fees, repairs, things like that are what I consider expenses. Take your rent minus all those out and you'll be left over with your cash flow, monthly cash flow. Oh, got a little too far ahead there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so when you're looking at cash flow, there's what's also considered gross cash flow. Uh, my formula for that is, is a rent minus uh, PITI, which stands for principal, interest, taxes, insurance, otherwise your mortgage payment. And uh, PM for property management equals your gross monthly cash flow. So if you got $1,000 in rent and you subtract out the six fifty dollars of your mortgage payment, also minus out $80 in property management fees, uh, 8% is this example, you're left over with $270 a month in gross cash flow. Is that good? I don't know, what's your criteria? Uh, for some, this may be fantastic. For other th others, this might be low. Uh, but we're gonna kinda dig into this a little bit deeper in the next slide. Because now we're gonna talk about net cash flow. Uh, the difference between net cash flow and gross cash flow is that the reality is, is that there's additional expenses uh, factored into the pro forma. So the formula is rent minus PITI, mortgage payment, minus the property management fee, minus other additional expenses to then equal your net cash flow. So again, going back to my formula as before, $1,000 in rent minus 650 mortgage payment minus $80 in property management fee minus a percentage of their rent for other expenses. So this example, uh, we're gonna use $100 leaves you with $170 a net cash flow. Is that a good deal once you break it down a little bit even more? Uh, for some, yes. For some, no. Again, I can't decide that for you. Uh, all investors really have their own criteria that they use when analyzing rental property. I've been selling property for 12 years now, and uh, a lot of people do it a lot of different ways. So... In the last slide, when I talked about other expenses, these are the other expenses I was referring to. Vacancy, repairs, and CapEx. Uh, a lot of times this is, uh, in a pro forma, they'll add this as a percentage based on the rent factored uh, for possible future vacancy or repairs. Um, what percentage should you use? I mean, it's hard to say. Uh, some people will use a high side of eight to 10%. Some people use a low side of three to 5%. I mean, it's like I said, every investor is different. They each have their own risk tolerances. 
Uh, sometimes people will look at data based on the area where they're purchasing the property to kind of try to determine vacancy rates. Uh, a, a good resource is, is to reach out to who may be managing your property. If you're using a management company, a lot of times you can check with them on uh, what historically has been happening in a particular era, area to try to gauge you know, vacancy factors. Um, repairs is another percentage. Uh, very similar to vacancy, you know, are you going to go on the low side or the high side? Um, CapEx uh, stands for capital expenditures. That's also usually a percentage of the rent factored for future replacement, typically for larger items, things like the roof, HVAC, hot water tank, you know, those components, uh, essentially every kind of component when you're looking at property has a expected life span. You know, how long are these things projected to last? So my formula here is rent minus mortgage payment minus management fees minus vacancy and repairs and capex to equal uh, again you know net cash flow. Uh, you know keep in mind though that when you you know when you start I hate to use the word piling on but when you start adding more uh, factors into your formula that essentially take away from cash flow. Uh, the numbers for that particular property will start to look less attractive. Returns, monthly cash flow start to get lower. So, you know, you just kind of have to determine where you need to be. I'm going to kind of get into CapEx just a little bit more and maybe kind of give you an idea on how some people factor for this. So, I'm using uh, three items here I'm using a roof. I'm using an HVAC system and I'm using a hot water tank. So uh, in my business, an average roof is going to cost me around $5,000 to replace. And that's typically for a total tear off 30 year architectural shingle home. And that's for the average rental property that we're doing. Roofs in theory, I mean, architectural shingle roofs are stated to last maybe 25 to 30 years. But I mean, let's just take 20 years on this one, for example. So. You take your 5,000, divide that by 20 years, uh, breaks it down to $250 a year. But if you want to break that down monthly, you take 250 divided by 12 months. In theory, you should allocate $20 per month towards a new roof. Uh, you run the same pro forma here for an HVAC system. We can get a brand new HVAC system installed for, like I said, about $4,000 cage included. Uh, $16 you would allocate per month for that. And a hot water tank, uh, you know, an average hot water tank should last 10 years. Uh, we can get a hot water tank installed today for around 800 and you'd in theory allocate $6 per month for that. So with these numbers in front of here, uh, just for these particular three items, you would allocate $42 per month as a, as a CapEx expenditure towards future repairs. Is this accurate? Hard to say. Uh, you know, the interesting thing about vacancy and maintenance and, and CapEx is, is that nobody really, at least nobody that I've talked to, nobody really actually sets this money aside. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a novel thought, but nobody really takes additional uh, cash flow and diverts it to like another account for these factors. But you know, if somebody does, great. But uh, I don't know anybody who does. But I at least wanted to kind of give you a breakdown on how somebody may allocate or try to come up with how to factor what they should be using for capex. Here's one option. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, return on investment uh, or ROI, as you might see the abbreviation, is. Essentially, it, you take the annual cash flow and you divide that by your cost of getting into the property. Uh, when I say cost of getting into the property, uh, it's typically your down payment and the closing cost. So if you're purchasing a property, you're doing 20% down plus closing cost. My, my little uh, example down here is uh, if, you make, if you get $4,000 in annual cash flow, uh, you divide that by the 20,000 that you have to put down in this example, it looks like we're buying a $100,000 home and you have estimated $5,000 in closing costs. So uh, 4,000 divided by 25,000 gives you a 16% gross return on investment. Uh, is that good? I don't know. Uh, that sure looks good. But like you said, if we took this gross number and we factored in the 
vacancy and repairs and, and capex, that number is going to shrink quickly. But uh, simply put, this is a, this is the basic formula on how you factor uh, what ROI should be. <clears throat> Purchase to rent ratio, otherwise could be known as the one percent rule. Uh, this is this is kind of a a general guideline of what a lot of investors try to accomplish in purchasing property. Uh, essentially, what it means is the rent, the monthly rent, needs to be one percent of what the purchase price is. So, my formula is simply put: monthly rent divided by purchase price. Uh, in our business, and you know, kind of kind of evaluating other companies who do what we do, because like I said, we're a turnkey property. Uh, I have noticed that properties that are purchased around the seventy-five thousand dollar range or less, uh, it's it's not difficult to achieve the one percent rule. You know, a house that you might buy for seventy-five thousand could maybe have seven hundred fifty to maybe eight hundred dollars in rent. It just depends. Uh, houses in the eighty thousand to a hundred thousand dollar rent, usually you're you're slightly over 1% or rate at about 1%. Uh, when you start moving up in price, you know, say like 105,000 or more, uh, the 1% the rule, at least from what I've seen from other uh, operations like ours, is, is the 1% rule starts to fall under 1%. It uh, doesn't mean it's a bad deal or anything like that. You know, there's a lot of other factors to look at as far as quality of renovation and things like that. But, um, at some point in time, the the one percent rule is not going to keep up to the purchase price, and that usually starts happening once you start going up in better neighborhoods, higher priced homes with higher rent. All right, grading properties. Uh, one of my favorite things to talk about. Uh, it's something that kind of started surfacing, I don't know, four or five years ago, and most resellers or, or companies like us were not really fans of the grading system. Uh, but you know we we find that a lot of people look at you know essentially put is this an A B C D quality type home? Um, every investor is going to grade homes a little bit differently. You know, like here I'm in Memphis and there's several uh, turnkey providers like us, and we might grade the same home differently. It just it just depends on the provider. Um, the grading system is really a personal opinion. There's there's no official grading system out there somewhere. Uh, there's no matrix that if you pump in the address, it's going to shoot you out a, some type of actual legit grading program. I mean, it just does not exist. It's all personal opinions. And because they're personal opinions, at times uh, they can be deceitful or maybe misleading. Um, you know, it just depends. That's why a lot of people are really not fans of the grading system. Uh, <clears throat> and, to, you know, to maybe take the grading system one step further, there really could be two grades uh, for property. It just depends. And what I mean by that is, is that, uh, you know, there could be kind of a grade based on the area, you know, neighborhood, the location, but there can also be a grade on the house. So what I mean, and, you know, we're going to actually, you know, I'll get into that in the next slide because I actually pulled up a few examples uh, for you to take a look at. Uh, all these properties here that you're looking at, with the exception of one, are homes that we have sold or, or actually in the process of selling. Uh, so this first property here that you're looking at in the top left corner, 55000 with six fifty in rent, and it's a 3-2. You look at that property and it's a semi-attractive looking little property. It's decent. Uh, now, obviously, I don't have addresses on here, but uh, I didn't put them on here for a reason. This particular property here in Memphis, uh, I would personally give this probably a D grade. It's in a zip code here in Memphis that we do not purchase properties in. It, there's nowhere in this zip code that we want to buy. For us, it's not a desirable location, uh, but it looks good. Uh, you might have somebody who wants to grade this thing a high C or maybe even a B, but uh, for, for us and for our opinion, it's a low grade. And, and part of that is due to location, uh, the type of rent, 
that it brings in. From a house standpoint, it's a three bedroom, two bathroom. That's fantastic and it looks great, but the location and the rent, that's why I grade it so low. Now the house to, to the right for 150,000, 1350 in rent. Uh, this house is in a area of Memphis known as Cordova. Uh, this house is very common amongst the other homes in its location. Uh, essentially they all kind of look like this in one way or another. This house, in my opinion, is what I would maybe consider an A type investment based on, you know, its location and the sales price and the type of rent that it brings in. Bottom left hand corner, the house for 80,000. Now this where this is where it kind of gets a little unique here and why, why I mentioned uh, previously a house that has two grades. This house neighborhood wise, it's in an area that I would consider like a, an, an average C quality type neighborhood. Uh, you see that we have it stated here that this house is a three bedroom, two and a half bathroom. Well, house wise, you could almost say that this is a solid B type house, but the neighborhood is a C area. And the reason why I say that is, is this house is a little unique for the fact that it's not because it's a three bedroom, but for the fact that it's a two and a half bathroom. Most houses in this neighborhood or most homes in the in the general area are three bedroom, one bathroom home with maybe a half bath attached. So for the fact that this house has another full bathroom and it had an, a bonus addition on it, so it actually has two living rooms, makes this home itself very, very desirable in this neighborhood. So the house is a B, but the neighborhood's a C. So you see what I mean? It, how, you know, how deep do you want to get into this grading scale? Um, the house next to it, 105,000 for 995 in rent. In my opinion, this is an average B home. Uh, it's it's very similar to other homes in the neighborhood, and it brings in a similar rent. Uh, the house to the right for 130,000 with 1,250 in rent, 42. Uh, I would classify that as an A property. Uh, it's a it's a large home rented out very quickly, uh, 130,000 plus, I mean, super nice neighborhood, A type investment. So uh, again, you know, these are all subjective. This is all my opinion based on, uh, you know, how I feel these homes are. And what's interesting is, is when we talk with clients uh, who come to us, say in markets like California, you know, they look at these houses and it's like, you know, you, you're, you're trying to help the out-of-state investor uh, in a very high-priced market where they see these types of homes in their market and they would sell for maybe 400000 and I'm showing them this house for 100000 and I'm trying to tell them it's a B neighborhood and, and sometimes people have a hard time grasping that concept. So uh, the grading scale is, it is what it is. It's very subjective. It's personal opinion. I've probably spent a little more time on this than I initially wanted to, but I'm just trying to help people understand uh, how I see the grading scale. All right, purchase to rent to rehab quality. What does this even mean? Uh, as someone who is a reseller of homes uh, in the turnkey space here, um, I thought I'd kind of give an example. It's just, it's just kind of something for investors to think about, you know, based on trying to, you know, when you're trying to determine what your criteria is, what you're trying to get out of a property. Uh, so the example here I have is, is you're looking at a home for sale and it's a $110,000 purchase price and it's rented out for $1,000 a month and it's had a, a very nice renovation done to it. I mean, the, the person who renovated it probably spent $25,000, $30,000, lots of new components, new roof, HVAC, exterior paint, interior paint, flooring, bathrooms, kitchen updates, uh, the works essentially. But when you look at those numbers, you know, one of the things you can notice right offhand is it does not meet the 1% rule. Is that going to be an issue for you? For some, it will. Uh, what's the monthly cash flow look like on the property? Does it meet your criteria? Uh, when you start factoring in vacancy and maintenance things, then what does the number look like? So there's really a lot of things to take into account, but let's look at right below that. Let's say you look at the exact same property, the exact same home, but now the sales price is $100,000 with $1,000 in rent. Still had a really good renovation, but you know this one does not have a new roof or a new HVAC system or even a new hot water tank. You know, 
in my in my business, those three things alone, that's about ten thousand dollars in, in expenses when you look at a roof, HVAC, and hot water tank. As obviously, if you refer back to the capex slide, uh, you're at about ten thousand. So, as someone who's buying a property, is it more important to you to, in this example, you know, buy the house for ten thousand dollars more, which if you're looking at it from your down payment standpoint, you're only putting another $2,000 down on the home, but now you have these uh, major items to the home that are brand new and have a, a long life expectancy, or are you more concerned about trying to hit, in this example, 1%, but you may have to replace these three components in the next five to seven years, and you will be $10,000, maybe a little bit more out of your pocket. I can't answer that for you. Uh, every investor, like I said, has their own criteria, risk risk tolerance. Um, you know, on one end, you could argue it would be the better way to go with uh, the hundred ten thousand dollar purchase because the quality is superior. Uh, all these things, just, there's more peace of mind. Uh, but on the flip side, some investors are willing to roll the dice. So you have to answer that for yourself. All right, so we're gonna kind of wrap this up. Um, how does somebody decide or determine what's more important over others in regards to the things we've kind of talked about today? Cash flow, return on investment, uh, taking into effect the, the grading scale and the 1% rule. Um, you know, I think when you look at this, you kind of have to de determine what are you hoping to accomplish? Uh, like I said, you know, I. I talk to investors who they their main focus is returns. Uh, markets like ours here in Memphis are heavily cash flow driven. It's one of the the more popular topics. People you know like to look at Memphis for cash flow. Um, sometimes what you can afford could also dictate what you're going to get. Sometimes you don't necessarily get to make or, or have as much say because if you only have uh, enough money to cover the purchase of say like a seventy thousand dollar home to cover the down payment plus closing costs there well chances are you're going to be looking at a c grade on average type property uh, as on the flip side if you've got an investor who has plenty of money and they can kind of dictate what they want to do uh, you know what what factors are more important than the other uh, in a perfect world, we would have a solid combination of all of them uh, to come up with the perfect deal. So if you find that, like, please let me know. But uh, you just kind of need to look at lots of property and, and determine what your ultimate goal is on why you're buying single family property um, from these particular standpoints. So that's kind of all I have for today.